writers and producers may be zeroing in. This is a critique, not a criticism. Perhaps but I think it's an important conversation that we need to have. Let's talk about the good, the bad, and the reality of union actions in the United States. Here's my thesis statement. There are multiple high-profile labor actions happening across the United States at this moment, but there is no such thing as a labor movement. Here's the thing. What Sean Fain, the head of the United Auto Workers Union, is doing right now is a masterclass in disruption. I'm a fan. The UAW revealed a hardcore strategy to send workers to the picket lines at all three of the major Detroit-based automakers, about 13,000 workers in all. And nothing I'm about to say should take away from this show of strength and solidarity. But if we add these 13,000 to the most recent figures as of August, this brings the national total to somewhere around 325,000 workers who are out on strike. Depends on how you define good. The auto workers join the striking members of both the Writers Guild of America and the Screen Actors Guild who have been out since the middle of the summer. Between them, SAG and WGA make up 170,000 of the total, or a little more than half. For comparison's sake, I built a simple chart that looks back over several important years in the United States. The BLS began officially tracking work stoppage data in 1947, so I went out a couple of years to 1949 to allow the data to mature. Now, by this time, the GI Bill was five years old. The wartime economy had come to an end, and the country experienced a brief recession. Unemployment peaked during this year as well. Workers expressed their displeasure with 262 work stoppages involving 2.5 million workers, which was 4.2% of the workforce at the time. Fast forward to 1968, one of the most tumultuous times in American history. 362 work stoppages involving 1.8 million workers, or 2.3% of the workforce. There were 44 stoppages involving 184,000 workers, or 0.15% of the workforce, in 1990. 23 stoppages in 2022 involving 120,000 workers, or 0.07% of the workforce. And so far this year, we have 325,000 or so workers out on strike in 21 separate actions. 0.19% of the workforce. During times of economic distress, labor has wielded the power of the strike to reckon with the corporate class to varying degrees of success. If we go back further than our 1949 start date, labor actions in the United States were even more severe, and so was the response to them. But rather than litigate the rise of organized labor from the mid-19th century through the Depression, I think it's more instructive to look at the working class struggles in the post-war period when the United States emerged as the hegemonic power in the world. One of the reasons we went on such a deep dive of socialism was to call attention to the divide between organized labor and left political movements. Nowhere was this divide more extreme than in the United States. Take the story of Eugene Debs, for example. Debs was perhaps the greatest champion of union labor in U.S. history. Now, there will be labor historians that likely take exception with this statement, but I'll stand by it until I'm taught otherwise. Though Debs became the face of the Socialist Party running for president four times, he never abandoned his roots as a labor organizer. But even though he was beloved by the working class, he was unable to bridge the divide between trade unions and industrial unions, let alone the political class. We even covered how it was Samuel Gompers of the AFL who ultimately sold Debs and the Socialists down the river to split the labor vote in Debs' last two bids for the presidency. But the U.S. isn't alone in this distinction. Fissures between the left political class and organized labor were commonplace throughout Europe as well. And that strikes at the heart of the thesis here today. If we think about union struggles in the U.S., they have always been in sync with capitalism. In fact, they very much support one another. Liar! Liar! He's a liar! Hear me out. Think about what the unions today are fighting for. It's pretty fundamental stuff. Better benefits, higher wages, more paid time off. When the UAW yells about billions spent in stock buybacks, it's framed as greedy and wasteful because those funds could otherwise be used to incentivize workers. They even go so far as to say clearly that those very profits are the result of the workers' labor, not the executives or the shareholders. 
then the corporate mouthpieces are trained to respond like this. Well, you know, when you talk about executive comp, for instance, my, my comp, over 92% of the compensation is performance linked. In addition to the 20% um, increases in salaries that we have on the table right now, our employees have been enjoying profit sharing for several years, and, and through the last few years, it's been uh, record profit sharing. And so the way that General Motors is set up is that when the company does well, everyone does well. This is GM CEO Mary Barra. There's two parts to her response. The first is the idea of executive compensation based on incentives. So let's talk comp. In 2022, her base salary was $2 million, but her compensation was $29 million. She's raked in more than $200 million since 2014. But when she talks about performance, she's talking mostly about share price. And that brings us to the other part of the equation. What's the best way to increase shareholder value and stock price these days? You got it. In fact, the GM board authorized the company to increase the buyback threshold in 2022 from $3.5 billion to $5 billion. So not only did car prices increase upwards of 35% after the pandemic, and not only did corporations take in money from the federal government to get through the pandemic, they used a bunch of this money to buy back shares. That's what she means by performance. Ah, horseshit! Then there's the profit sharing piece that the employees received. GM was pretty boastful in 2021 that their profit sharing plan put an extra $12,000 check on average into the pocket of every GM auto worker. Not bad, right? All told, it was about $500 million spread among the employees who average about $80,000 in compensation normally. According to the Social Security Administration, the average national wage index per person in 2021 was about $60,000. So GM's perspective is, hey, we're paying more than the national average and you got a piece of the profit, so what's your problem? And there are a fair number of Americans who live without union protections who look at that stance and kind of agree. But let's get more to the point here. The $500 million split among the workers in a profit sharing plan sounds great. That's $500 million spread among 40,000 eligible workers based upon profits against $27 million allocated to one person based on stock performance. Now let's frame it another way. In the same financial period, GM posted a $17 billion profit. So the profit sharing that went to the employees was about 3% of the total profits, whereas the shareholder buyback was around 30%. That's why the UAW is calling BS, and so should you, and so should everyone. But that's still not the larger point. Collective bargaining was guaranteed to all American workers by the National Labor Relations Board Act of 1935, part of the suite of programs that came into existence during the Depression. Then, in 1947, Congress passed the Taft-Hartley Act that essentially gave corporations the ability to create hostile organizing conditions by protecting all forms of intimidation and smear campaigns as free speech. At the depth of the Great Depression, when the NLRB Act was introduced, union membership hovered around 12%. By the time Taft-Hartley was introduced, about a third of U.S. workers were in a union. And since Taft-Hartley, it's been on a steady and precipitous decline. Union membership in the United States is now around 10%, which is below where we were in the Great Depression, just prior to the NLRB even coming into existence. So that's how far we've fallen and why I can't in good conscience call what's happening today a movement. 1949, one third of all Americans were in a union. The United States was about to go on a 25-year economic tear with workers participating in the upside. 262 work stoppages involving 2.5 million workers, more than 4% of the workforce in 1949. Now that's a movement. Going from 0.07% to 0.19% is an uptick. It's not even a trend. It's a rounding error. Contrast that with the breathless media coverage on both sides of the political aisle. Liberal media, mostly in support of the workers in a way that we admittedly haven't seen in quite a while, and conservative media basically saying it's the end of the world. And usually the truth can be found somewhere in the middle, except that the real truth isn't even on this same spectrum. Again, think about the gains that the workers seek. Increased pay to cover the cost of living adjustments, fair wages in the face of landmark corporate profits, better benefits like paid time off, paid family leave, subsidized child care, better health benefits. Best case scenario, the 0.19% of workers asking for these things get everything that they want. And maybe it encourages 10 or 20,000 more workers to do the same thing. That's still not a movement. That's a blip. 
Now contrast this with workers in Denmark. When workers in Denmark ask for more, it's more than a blip because 67% of workers are unionized. In Sweden, it's 70. In Finland, it's 74%. Now it's different all throughout Europe. And one of the more interesting cases is France, where shockingly only 8% of the workforce is unionized, but 98% are covered by collective bargaining. And when the French workers don't get their way, they organize quickly. They take to the streets and they literally burn shit to the ground. See, the workers in France created a different culture. They never stopped stoking the flames of a revolutionary labor movement. But again, there is no labor movement in the United States. That culture simply doesn't exist here. The benefits sought by the working class are derivative of the capitalist system. They're elements of the wage slavery that Bakunin, Proudhon, and Luxembourg pointed out over 100 years ago. See, when Marxists and syndicalists argued for a dictatorship of the proletariat, it didn't imply violence in the way that we associate with the word dictatorship these days. It literally just meant control and ownership. Now, it doesn't mean that the UAW isn't fighting for a more fair and just outcome within the capitalist system. It is. But we have to reframe the struggle to demonstrate that even victory in this fight only further serves to calcify the rules of engagement between the classes. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't fight the good fight. Moreover, the WGA and SAG have added an important layer to the narrative by fighting for the creative economy. Beyond the fact that they make up more than half of the striking workers, the high-profile nature of their work keeps labor in the public eye. Now, the flip side, and I don't mean flip side by downside, I mean the flip side is that a creative work stoppage affects the creators, the companies that they work for, and the shareholders, to be sure. But it doesn't bring the supply chain to a grinding halt, for example. It doesn't increase prices at the pump in a way that causes pain or average Americans become uncomfortable. So in many ways, that actually makes the struggle that they're going through all the more courageous. They're fighting for something much bigger than themselves in a sacrificial way. But imagine this. If every healthcare worker, every educator, and every sanitation worker simultaneously walked off the job in protest of the capitalist class, that would signify a change, a movement. When a fraction of a fraction of the workforce has the guts to stand up against the corporate class, they might stand to gain a little, but they risk a lot more in the process. The point is that I have a greater appreciation for Marxist theory and class struggle than ever before. And at the same time, I can't help but be pragmatic and to state the obvious. Here's where we can go back to the lessons from our socialism series. A great number of things have to come together to create the conditions for revolution. And I think it's fair to say that the working class is a fundamental part of the revolutionary equation, even today. But there's also the legal system. Look at how the Federalist Society has torn apart the courts. There's what's taught in schools. I mean, PragerU is being added to curriculums and we're back to banning books. We need organized interest groups in disparate regions working collaboratively toward a stated purpose. Shared messaging political movements, social movements, protests, or outright riots. Then there's the all-important catalyzing and potentially catastrophic event that threads them all together with the hope that there's a like-minded bureaucratic apparatus capable of seizing power from below to implement reform and manage systems. The Paris Commune, Haymarket Riots, the Great Depression, the February and October revolutions in Russia, Cuba, 1959. But none of this happens without class consciousness. And how do you raise the consciousness of a class that doesn't know that it exists? Working class used to be an identity. Now it's a historical reference. What defines working class anyway? Household income? Occupation? Perhaps the worst lie ever told is the so-called American dream because it convinced millions of wage slaves that if they hustle, if they keep grinding 24-7, 365, they can break out and get the land of opportunity, get what's theirs. Day job, Uber driver at night, weekend influencer, just keep hustling, keep grinding. Don't call yourself working class because that's your grandparents and don't let the left woke agenda keep you from reaching your dreams. Make your bed, hit the gym, work hard, play hard, hustle, grind, get yours, keep yours, and close the door behind you while we distract the others. CEOs making 400 times the average employee? I heard schools are putting litter boxes in bathrooms. Inflation due to corporate greed and price gouging? Yo, Tucker Carlson said Barack Obama's gay. Corporations invested in student loan programs lobby to have the courts reverse debt cancellation? Everyone knows mermaids are white. Divert, distract, repeat. 
the American dream has poisoned class consciousness. 13% of the workforce in the new economy works remotely. 29% have hybrid positions. 36% of the workforce is considered independent, which is comprised of gig workers, freelancers, contract workers, and part-timers. 61% of Americans say they're living paycheck to paycheck. The capitalist system has sliced us and diced us and broken us apart. The other feature of the capitalist system is even more underhanded. Capitalism's like a mysterious conductor. It has no face, no name, but it has its own rhythm. It just kind of knows when we have a little too much in our wallet, so it knows when to pick our pockets. And it knows when we're up against a wall, so maybe unemployment lasts a few weeks longer this time. Maybe there's a check in the mail, a pause on debt collecting. It's always been that way. An election about to swing one way during a recession, then all of a sudden, a brief recovery, a bumper crop, government contracts come through, maybe a tax cut, but not for you, for them, the owners, the employers, the job creators. So what to do, what to do? Even if all of the conditions required to ignite a revolution were in place, who would revolt if the masses are separated both physically and spiritually? A class cannot gain consciousness if it doesn't even know it exists. The Biden NLRB recently made the most historic ruling since Taft-Hartley, and that's not an exaggeration. Any company caught messing with the organization process will automatically have to recognize the union information. This is one of the most significant developments in American labor in my lifetime, to be sure. And it's more than a warning shot. It's a blow to any corporation that attempts to shut down union organizing. Of course, a decision from this Biden-appointed board can just as easily be reversed under a new GOP administration, and I can pretty much guarantee that it would be immediate. So it's temporary, but it's meaningful nonetheless. This ruling, actors and writers drawing outsized attention to worker grievances and inequality, the masterful job that the UAW is doing to force the automaker's hands, the left finally showing some level of solidarity with union organizers, it's all good stuff. But remember, at 0.19%, you cannot call it a movement. Capitalism is still winning, going away. So what else is out there? Now, I know there's a lot of members of this audience that share my enthusiasm for Professor Wolf and the Democracy at Work organization. One of the major parts of his agenda is to promote the concept of worker cooperatives. It's a thing in other parts of the world. But can it work in America? I think so. The world's largest cooperative is the Mondragon Corporation of Spain, 81,000 employees, $14.5 billion in revenue. Here's an excerpt from a New Yorker article. Quote, in 2021, the network brought in more than 11 billion euros in revenue. The collective enforces 505 types of patents and employs about 2,400 full-time researchers. It also owns subsidiaries in countries including China, Germany, and Mexico, and competes effectively in international markets, winning contracts from firms such as General Electric and Blue Origin. The odds are good that key elements of something within 100 feet of you, an espresso maker, a gas grill, a car, were made at Mondragon." End quote. Now, in fairness, no corporation, even Mondragon, exists without controversy. In fact, one of the biggest challenges that they've recently faced is an increase in CEO pay relative to the lowest Mondragon worker. It was quite a scandal. A new policy allows CEOs pay of... It allows them pay of... God, I can barely say it. What is it? 20 times? 50 times? 100? Six. According to the Economic Policy Institute, CEO pay in America has, quote, skyrocketed 1,460% since 1978, and that CEOs were paid 399 times as much as a typical worker in 2021, end quote. Mondragon members tortured themselves over whether to bump the CEO pay ceiling from five and a half to six times the lowest worker in the cooperative. And here's the thing. Worker cooperatives already exist in the United States. In fact, there are more than 600 of them. Again, it's a rounding error, but it's a start. Not only do they work, they can develop alongside unions and in many cases, support one another. So let's thread together a few different narratives from the work that we've done together. See, this is different than the neoliberal New Democrat proposals under Bill Clinton that attempted to turn workers into entrepreneurs through capitalist debt models. This is different than trade unions fighting for crumbs that fall from the capitalist table. Millions of workers in other countries are worker owners, and in the U.S., it's only thousands. 
Now think about our sustainability episodes. Cooperatives tend to be more sustainability-minded as well. But to get from thousands to millions of workers requires a worker revolution. Now let's think about the conditions required to promote and sustain a revolution, a permanent revolution, as Leon Trotsky would say. Generative AI is a catalyzing event that is transforming work. The millennial and Z generations are more socially conscious and digitally savvy. Tens of millions of boomers are exiting the workforce as we speak. A uh, bye bye Inequality is reaching a tipping point. But we also know from Robert Owen's New Harmony experiment, along with countless examples of what happens to the worker mindset during recessions, is that American workers, what they want more than anything, is a steady paycheck, a secure retirement, health care coverage, and a future for themselves and their families. But grinding against this need, somewhere deep down and buried in our DNA, is something else. The palpable notion of the American dream. That's just part of our duality that causes us to fight our natural instincts and ultimately settle for what's handed to us. To be a worker with comfort or part of the owner class, that's the tension that has as of yet been unresolvable. The cooperative model says, why not both? Having this conversation does something else. It shifts the narrative focus and in doing so raises consciousness. Americans may never again see themselves as working class, but that doesn't mean we can't have class consciousness. It's just some food for thought. Support the unions, raise consciousness, and don't just fight the power. Be the power. Here endeth the lesson.